Today, if you have your Bibles, join me once again in the book of Romans chapter 8. This is the same text that we had last week. This is because this is part two of that message. And we're going to read the same text that we did, uh, beginning with verse 28 in Romans 8 and going through verse 39. Romans 8, 28 to 39. And if you haven't uh, yet, I encourage you to, to go back and, and listen to the uh, message from last week so you can get a full picture of the, the two-parter. Romans 8, 28 to 39 says, We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. For those He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him freely grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Last week we started this two-part message that is entitled, Rest Assured. And we looked at the first three verses of the text and we saw that God works things out for those who love Him, that He fulfills His purpose for the believer, and that He will glorify every one of His children. But this passage of Scripture says so much more to us. The facts about what the Lord will do for the believer gives us the assurance that we need to truly rest from the many cares and troubles of this life. And it offers us the tools we need to get this wonderful news to those who need it most. So let's pick up where we left off and see what else God will do to allow us to rest in the assurance of Him. We had three points last week, so the first one today is actually the fourth overall. But we see today that God acts for the believer and not against. Verses 31 through 33 says, What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he then not also with him freely grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. The most glorious truth in the world is that God didn't have to act for us, but He did. He loves every single person, no matter what their condition, no matter how far in sin they have gotten themselves into, He still loves every person. And what this does, or at least it should, give us the hope and assurance that there is absolutely nothing at all that can separate us from God's love or His plan for the believer. God's plan is perfect, absolute. His love is perfect and absolute. And it shows the completion of His purposes for us in our life. This kind of restates what we talked about last week, but it goes a little further in explaining why. So, so here, think about this. Our assurance is God Himself. We have a list of things, but it all goes back to God Himself. He is our assurance. Everything He did, everything He continues to do, who He is... That is our assurance. And if He is for us, who could possibly stand against us? He is our Savior. He didn't hesitate to hold back His Son to die in our place. No. 
Think about it. God weighed humanity's eternal separation from him against his own son. And he was willing to sacrifice his son so that humanity would have a chance. So that humanity would have a hope. That humanity would not be lost. Someone had to bear the penalty for sin, which was death. Death meaning separation from the Father and the torments of hell. And so he handed his son over to be our substitute, to pay a price that we could not pay. It's like maybe going to a restaurant and you get the bill and it's $50 even, but you reach in your pocket and you've only got a $20 bill. They take the $20 bill, but you're still $30 short. That's the way us and sin works. We can't pay off the debt. Everything we can offer still comes up short. Only Jesus could pay that. And God said, I'm sending my son for them. And Jesus died willingly for us. And you know what the real beauty of this is? There's a lot of beauty here. There's a lot of things that we can take from this portion of Scripture. But what I find most assuring, most comforting, most glorious, is that He did all of this while we were still sinners. While we were still in rebellion, enemies of the Lord. Is there any greater love than that? Remember the words of Jesus, greater love has no man than this, than he laid down his life for a friend. That's great love. You know what greater love is? He who would lay down his life for his enemies. And that's what Jesus did. He laid down his life for his enemies. And who was his enemy? You were. I was. Every human being was his enemy. And yet he died in our place. Why? Because he loved us. His great love. Romans 5, 8 says, But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't die for those who, who uh, cleaned themselves up, who said, well, I need to fix all of these things, and then I'll be worthy enough for Jesus to die for me. And he looked at you and said, well, all right, fine. You did what you could, and I'll go ahead and take care of the rest. No, he died for us while we were in sin. Unloving, unlovable, unworthy, but he did it for us. Galatians 1.4 says, Who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. Jesus fulfilled the will of God. And back in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, verse 6 says, We all, like sheep, went astray. We all have turned to our own way. And the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. What we deserved, Jesus took willingly, so we didn't have to. So, so wonderful. God is also our provider. If he's done so much for us, which he has. Just look back in your life, see everything that God has done for you that you're aware of. If he has already sent his son to die for us, if he has already forgiven all those who call upon his name, isn't it reasonable that he's also going to take care of us with anything and everything that we need? When David said that he had been young and now he was old, and he'd never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. You know what he was saying was that God always meets our needs. Are they things that we want? Are there things that, that we desire, that we think we need, that we don't get? Does that mean that God doesn't love us and isn't taking care of us? No. He knows exactly what we need. And he gives us what we need. He's already given his very best. So we know that he's going to take care of the rest. He provides for us spiritually. He provides for us eternally. He provides for us sometimes even materially. He gives us the fruit of the Spirit to endure as a believer. He gives us the deliverance that we need from the world of sin and suffering. And he provides us with the necessities of this life. And he gives it to us all freely. Just like he gave the gift of his son freely. He gave it before we even realized that we needed to ask for it. 
He gives us our needs. He meets our needs even before we know we need to ask. And it's all through Christ alone. No matter how much we struggle, no matter how much we suffer through the troubles and trials of this world, I assure you that God will see us through it all. And I can assure you of that because that's what his word says. We've already read it. Philippians 4.19, Paul says, And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He does not say that God will meet our needs according to our riches in earth, but his riches in glory, which are limitless. So we know any need we have, he can meet. And the Lord provides for us by being our justifier. This is the best part. When we come to Jesus for forgiveness and salvation, God no longer charges us with sin. Who can lay any charge against God's people? The answer is only God. But if we have trusted in Jesus as our Savior, God forgives our sin and counts us as righteous. No one can charge us with being a failure with being lost, with being hopeless or helpless, with being defeated or being unworthy. Has anyone ever tried to do that? Maybe, maybe people in your life have tried to do that. More often than not, though, it's a voice inside your head that whispers these things to you. You're living for God. You're doing the best you can. You make a mistake. Things aren't working out. It's hard. It's a struggle. And you hear that voice. You're a failure. You're not doing anything that's worthwhile. Better to not do it and fail, or better to, to not even try and avoid failure than to give it your shot and make a fool of yourself. Maybe that voice whispers into you, are you sure? That God really loves you. Are you sure that God forgave you? I mean, if he did, wouldn't things be better? Wouldn't they be different, easier? Maybe the voice has said, you can't get out of this one. God overlooked this one. Yeah, he's done all these great things, but now, hmm, it's tougher than what you thought. And that's because God isn't there. You know what? You've lost. And mostly, Satan tries to convince us that we're not worthy. There's a, a thing, it's called imposter syndrome. And I think a lot of people have that. And that is, no matter what they do, they are so aware of their own shortcomings, their own fears, that they think they're fooling everybody else. And that pretty soon, everybody else is going to find out what a fraud they are. Wow. People look to me as a leader. I'm scared to death to lead people. And they're going to find out, and they're going to hate me. I have no business being here. I have no business doing this. I have no business trying to be someone that I'm not. And yet everybody thinks I am. And so I have to work twice as hard. And it's the, the shoe is going to fall any time, and everybody's going to see me for the failure that I am. I think every person has some level of that. Some people have it worse than others. But you know what? God doesn't see us like that. And that's what he's trying to remind us of here in Scripture. No one can charge us with those things. Other people can't. Satan can't. And you need to remember that you don't have to accuse yourself of these things. Could God charge us with these things? He most certainly could. But no matter how far short we've fallen, if we are truly his child, been saved by asking Jesus to forgive us of our sins and come in to be the Lord of our life, what God does instead is he picks up this failure, this unworthy person with no hope. And he justifies them. He justified you. He justified me. And he continues each day to conform us to the image of Jesus which we talked about last week. Philippians 1, 6 says, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Let's rephrase that. 
If God's brought you this far, he's not about to stop now. If God has done everything for you up to this point, trust him to keep on doing it. Romans 14.4 says, Who are you to judge another's servant? Before his own Lord he stands or falls. And he will stand because the Lord is able to make him stand. It's not our strength, it's God's strength. It's not our power, it's his power. And Hebrews 13.6 says, Therefore we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Next main point we want to look at is that Jesus does not condemn the believer. This is verse 34 from our text. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. The only person qualified to condemn us for sin is Jesus. But the good news is that if you know him, he doesn't. He doesn't do that. The opposite is true, actually. What did he do instead? Well, Jesus died for us. He, he, he was bearing our condemnation when he was on that cross. And when we honestly come to him for forgiveness, what does he do? He forgives us because that was the whole reason he died. When you come to Jesus and you think, I don't know if he'll, he, he will forgive me or can forgive me, remember that that was the reason he came in the first place. He died so that you could be saved. What else did he do? Jesus rose from the dead for us, proving that God was satisfied with Christ's death for us, that justice had been served, and it shows that every single one of us can have a new and better life with him. The fact that Jesus rose shows that God accepted what he did. You paid the price. Therefore, we can have hope. Jesus has also been exalted for us. He sits at the right hand of God, which shows us that we can go straight to the presence of God ourselves for all eternity, that Jesus is in complete control over life and death and judgment because he is the righteous right hand of God. And while he is there at the right hand of God, he makes intercession for us. He's our advocate who stands between us and God, and he bridges the gap and ensures that we are indeed forgiven and free. We have no right to go to God because he is God and we are us. But Jesus stands in the gap and says, you know what? He accepted what I did. She accepted what I did. Therefore, Father, accept them. They need you. And God does it because of his son, because he loves his son that much and because he loves us that much. Can there be a greater source of assurance and rest than knowing that the ruler of the universe, the creator of the universe, will and does do all this for us? Our assurance can be found in that no matter what we've done or where we've come from, if we come to Christ, we are not condemned. We're free. No matter how terrible the sin or how far it's taken us away from the Lord, Jesus delivers us and does not condemn us from our past. I cannot blame my son Daniel for World War II. I cannot blame my son David for September 11th. First of all, they had nothing to do with it, nor would they have had anything to do with it. First of all, that happened before they were born. When we come to Jesus, we are born again. Our life begins right then. So God takes all of those things that we have done, all of those terrible things in rebellion against him, and he throws them in the sea of forgetfulness. And he sees us as a newborn baby. How could he charge us with things that happened before we were born? Our life begins when we come to Jesus. What great assurance. <clears throat> He's not going to leave us down and discouraged and defeated. He's going to open his arms and pull us close to him. When we remember, when this world and Satan and other people try to remind us of who we were, Jesus wraps us in his arms and he says, you know what? You're not that person. You're my child and you've been forgiven. Jesus' third for today, 
says Jesus protects the believer no matter how severe the situation. He protects the believer no matter how severe the situation. It's easy to think that Jesus will be there for the small things. He'll see us through. But the big things, even when it seems like he's not there to help us, he's right there beside us and he's working his will in our life. Let's go back to our text and read verse 35 to 37. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. You know, these verses are right at the top of the best things found anywhere in the Bible. I mean, they're, they're in the top of the list for sure. Who or what can separate us from the love of God? You know, too many people, even believers, feel that God doesn't love them. Or he stopped loving them. Or he just couldn't love them at all. They're unworthy. They, they fall too far short. They're maybe, maybe too disobedient. They make too many mistakes. They fail too much and too often. So how could God possibly love them? Well, let's think to a child. Your child makes mistakes. Your child, you've got to tell them a hundred times to do something and they still won't. They argue with you. They do dumb things. Does that stop you from loving them? No. I used to say, you know what, I love my children. And some days that love goes into, I'd love to see how many times I could bounce them off the walls. I heard some amens, you got that. But I still love them with all my heart. God loves us. And he knows that we are imperfect. That does not give us license to do whatever we want. But what it does is remind us that when we stumble, he's there. When we need an advocate with the Father, we've got an advocate with the Father, Jesus, who sits there at his right hand. How could God love us? Because he's God. That's how. This verse makes it about as clear as can be. There is absolutely nothing. There is no circumstance. There is no event. There is no situation that can cause Jesus to turn away from us. Because his love is bigger than all of that. These verses tell us that no struggle, no agony or uncertainty, <coughs> excuse me, no attack or mistreatment, no hunger, no embarrassment, no deficiency, no danger to body, mind, or soul, not even death, can break the bond of love that Jesus has for us. We go through these times. Like we talked about a little while ago, maybe we hear that little voice that says that God has forsaken us, that he can't love us, but nothing could be further from the truth. These verses yell loud and clear that come what may, God loves us. Jesus will carry us through and he will care for us. The believer can rest assured that we have the Lord's protection. Jesus meets the basic necessities of life. He gives us rest and peace. He provides an escape from temptation. He comforts us through all of the trials that we face. He supplies our needs. He delivers us from persecution. And he brings us into his presence both here and in eternity. We are never apart from God. And when this life is over, we will not be apart from God because Jesus is with us every step of the way. His love cannot be separated from us. We who have accepted Jesus as our Savior have the assurance that he will always be with us. He will always love us, and nothing will undercut that. He cares for us no matter the situation that you're facing. He enables us to overcome the world. He shows his strength in our life, especially in our weakness. And he delivers us from fear. So I want you to think, when, when Satan is whispering to you, or when you get this, this human natural feeling, I'm too weak. I'm not good enough. Just remember that the weaker you are, the greater God's 
perfection and strength can shine. Say we're, we're, we're in the NCAA tournament, I'm trying to come up with a, an example here. Let's say your team scores 60 points and you score 10. Let's say you score 20, let's do that. Your team scores 60 points, you score 20. That's great, but you know, somebody else scores 18 and another 11 and I'm not gonna do the math. That's a good game, a good overall game. Let's say your team scores 60 points and you score 58 of them. Now the end score for the team is the same, but your big one shows the deficiency of all the others. When we are deficient, when we come up short, God steps in and he makes up the difference. And so the less we make, the, the, the final price or the final score has already been set. He makes up the difference. So when you're weak, don't say, well, I'm letting God down. Now say, this is a great time for God to shine in my life. Yeah, I can't do it. Yeah, I'm weak. Yeah, I don't know how it's going to all work out, but I know that it will work out because of him, not me. Don't limit what God can do because you're worried about how little you can do. Because as Paul said, God's strength is made perfect in my weakness. That's the beauty. That's the joy. That's the amazing thing that gives us assurance. That's protection you can believe in. So take that, State Farm. It's protection we can believe in. And finally today, Jesus protects the believer from even the most extreme forces against us. Verses 38 and 39 says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now this point might sound a lot like the one we just had, but it just drives the point home even more so that we can rest assured in what we have. Our previous point presented <clears throat> the questions we all have about our walk with the Lord and through this world. While this one states plainly that when we consider the worst things, the strongest things, the worst enemies, these aren't obstacles to God. There may be obstacles to us in our power, sure. But even the strongest and the worst of this world are nothing compared to what God can do. There is nothing in this universe that can separate the true believer from the love of God, the love that is found only in Christ Jesus our Lord. We can be fully persuaded or fully assured of this glorious fact. So just consider for, for a moment the forces that are mentioned here. Confronting death and leaving this world can't separate us from God's love. No trial or pleasure or comfort or obstacle or person can separate us either. No heavenly or spiritual creature, no being of any kind, no matter how powerful, can break that love. The things around us right now, the things or people we'll face tomorrow or next week or next year can't cut us off from God's love. No matter how high or how low we are, no matter what comes at us from above or below or around, no matter how strong, nothing can remove God's love for us through Christ. In other words, think of it this way. There is nothing we can think of and there is nothing we can't think of that has the ability to separate us from the love of God, period. That's it. Read some few more scriptures and then we'll close. Zephaniah 3, 17 says, The Lord your God is among you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet your soul in his love. He will delight in you with singing. Just like a proud parent. That's what he does. John 16, 26 and 27. On that day you will ask in my name. And I'm not telling you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you. Because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. We have access to God through Jesus. 
Ephesians 2, 4, and 5, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. Unmerited favor. 1 John 4, 9, God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Not ourselves, but him. And then Jeremiah 31, 3, the Lord appeared to him from far away and said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued to draw you to me by extending my faithful kindness and love to you. And that's what he does for every person who is adopted into his family by accepting Jesus and the forgiveness that he purchased for us on Calvary. So with that, we bring this two-part message to a close. I end with a question. Can you rest assured in what you have in this life? If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you have absolutely nothing at all to hope for. You have nothing to rely on. What you see is what you get. And then what you get is worse than you can possibly imagine. But if you have accepted Christ into your life, you need to know the assurances that you have in Him provided to you by God. You need to be aware of the assurances, to be assured, to know that you possess, that it belongs to you. Knowing that gives you rest. I've got a long trip to make. If you don't have a vehicle to get you there, it's a little trying. But if you own a car or a truck or some other form of transportation, you're okay. I don't have to worry about that because that's already covered. I got a, I got a $100 bill, uh, a payment, a $100 payment that I've got to make, but I have $200 in the bank. You've got it covered. You don't have to worry about that. So the promises and the assurances of God that are given to us, we need to know that they belong to us. So we don't need to worry about it. We just need to glory in the fact that, yes, I've got these things and I'm going to make it because of him, because of his faithfulness to me. These assurances that he has given us in his word give us hope, they give us victory, and they give us rest. We all know what it's like to worry. But we don't have to worry about so much, maybe, that we are worrying about because he's already taken care of it. I ask you to stand with me this morning as we wrap things up and as we end this message today in the two-parter as well. I want to remind you that, uh, of what you as a believer, as a child of the king, can be assured of. These are the seven things that we talked about last week and today. You can be assured that God works things out, all things out, for those who love him. He is determined to fulfill his purpose in your life. What he started, he's going to finish. He will glorify you. He has and will act for you and not against you. He doesn't condemn you. He protects you even in the severest circumstances, and he protects you in the most extreme experiences and from the most extreme forces that are against you in this life. With all of that, how can you not be joyful? How can you not find rest and assurance? So if you want these things or you desire to experience them even more deeply, I invite you, come to the altar today. Let me, let me talk with you about it. Let me pray with you. If you're watching online, I invite you to ask Jesus into your heart. Reach out to me. We can talk about it. But I want you to know that you can have the assurance that you need to see you through all things. Because God is capable of it. God is faithful to give that to those who have accepted him. What a wonderful father that we have. And you know what? He wants to show you just how much he cares. So let him and rest assured in the things that he's promised to all of his children. I appreciate you being here today. I hope that God has blessed you. I hope you've gotten something to, to encourage you, sustain you, or something to share. Uh, don't forget, after the service, if you would like to uh, be on our text list, if you have a, a mobile phone and would like to do that, um, just come and see me. I'll, I'll uh, be up here. Uh, you can fill it out. If you have any questions, I can, uh, can let you know about it, and then we'll try to get that started uh, as of today. So uh, if you're watching uh, at home, you want to be a part of uh, the 
prayer chain list or to get special announcements or whatever, uh, send me uh, a message. Uh, don't put it in the comments because you don't want your phone number out there, but send me a message on Facebook Messenger or, or call me, whatever, and we'll get your number down and get you what you need. So, uh, again, thank you. Appreciate you. And look forward to what he has in store for us this week. Come back Wednesday for our Bible study time. We're having a great time, as always. Love to see more people here. And we'll see you also again next Sunday. Let's be dismissed with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for all that you've done. We thank you for caring for us when we were unlovable, when we were unworthy. Thank you for seeing something in us that was worthy of saving. And we know that if Jesus came and died for us, we must be worth something. Remind us of that. And remind us that you're always with us to give us what we need. Go with us from this place today, Father. Work your will in our lives. Allow us to be a light and a testimony to you and bring us back again when we can gather together to share what you've done in us, through us, for us, and help us to be the kind of children that you can be proud of. We know you love us, and we want to make you as proud as we can. So again, thank you, Father. We love you, and we look forward to what you're going to do in our lives each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great day, and we'll see you soon.